Dr. Jeanette Beauchat is an associate professor and the division chief of obstetric anesthesiology at Vanderbilt University. She has served on the executive board as the secretary of the Society of Obstetric Anesthesia and Perinatology for the last two years. She received her medical doctorate from Northwestern University and completed her residency and chief year in anesthesiology at New York Presbyterian Hospital at Columbia University Medical Center. She returned to Chicago to complete her fellowship training in obstetric anesthesiology at Northwestern University, where she practiced for 11 years and served as associate fellowship director for five years and section chief of obstetric anesthesiology for two years. Dr. Boshaw obtained a master's in science in healthcare quality and safety and lead quality efforts at both Northwestern and Vanderbilt universities. She's an educator with 10 years of simulation education experience in designing, implementing, and conducting simulation curriculum. Her research interests lie in the areas of quality and safety on the labor floor, respiratory depression following neuraxial analgesia, and simulation education. So what a pleasure it is to uh, welcome you to our podium, Dr. Bouchard. Welcome. Thank you so much. Um, thank you, everyone, for attending this morning. I am hoping that I will um, be able to provide some value to your time in this next hour. It'll probably be, uh, my presentation will probably be a little less than an hour to allow for um, questions. I will just kind of jump right in here with some of the objectives. Uh, today we're going to be talking about identifying risk factors for respiratory depression, uh, for, in particular in the perioperative patient. We're going to be talking about some of the current guidelines and literature that support respiratory monitoring in our setting. We're going to be talking about the accuracy of the transcutaneous CO2 monitoring technology, as well as identifying some of the, the uses um, and where it's uh, most helpful in the perioperative period. We do know that respiratory failure is a huge economic burden. Uh, it, uh, in fact, it's estimated to be about seven billion, and that was in 2007, which is 10 years ago. So I presume with healthcare costs rising that this, uh, if someone were to relook at this, that this would be even higher still. It's not surprising that uh, respiratory failure increases hospital length of stay or ICU length of stay. None of that should surprise you. Um, certainly increasing the average hospital cost by $18,000 is, um, is concerning to everyone. And, you know, this is just the economic burden. Obviously, we haven't talked about the burden on families and the patients themselves. Uh, when we're talking about uh, postoperative respiratory failure, it actually accounts for 70% of deaths in the postoperative period. Uh, nationally, this leads to about 46,000 additional deaths in the postoperative period. Again, increases hospital length of stay, hospital costs, all not surprising. Uh, a third of uh, code, code blues are actually um, called due to uh, respiratory arrest. Obviously, we don't want to get to respiratory arrest. We'd like to identify those patients who have respiratory depression before it becomes respiratory failure. We, we've all seen these patients in the PACU, you know, that you're called for uh, respiratory arrest that, you know, you know, just minutes prior, they were increasing their, um, their uh, leaders per minute on their nasal cannula when, um, when in fact we probably should have been doing something else to, um, to identify this respiratory failure earlier or respiratory depression earlier in order to pre have prevented that respiratory arrest. The problem is, is we don't really have a great definition for respiratory depression. And if you look in the literature, it can be de defined in a just variety of ways. Some people use clinical parameters, things, and you know, most common being uh, what was the patient's respiratory rate, as well as you know, what was their sedation score, or it could even be something like were they given opioid antagonists like Narcan. Uh, then we have our, our respiratory monitoring uh, parameters that uh, people define for respiratory depression, um, arterial blood gas uh, numbers, you know, in particular PAO2 or P, uh, 
PA CO2. Um, and then, of course, most commonly things like uh, whether hypoxemia was identified, usually via pulse oximetry. And again, you know, the definition for what those cutoffs are defining respiratory depression can be anywhere from 85 to 90 percent, a duration, and then defining the duration is also variable. Um, and then, of course, uh, identifying hypercapnia. And again, these uh, definitions are variable for what that threshold is or duration. Um, when we look at respiratory depression, particularly in the post-operative setting, you know, the incidence is, again, all over the place, probably depending on how you define it. Um, the, but the incidence of critical respiratory events in the PACU can be as high as 7 percent. Uh, the incidence of respiratory depression, uh, in particular due to opioids in the postoperative period, are anywhere up to 2 percent. So uh, the Joint Commission, as you know, collects what they call sentinel event data, and they look at opioid-related sentinel events. Now, sentinel events aren't, you know, your ASA 4 or 5 coming in and having some um, bad outcomes. Sentinel events are, are, are defined as someone who comes in that you would not expect to have some very bad outcome like death or ischemic brain injury or uh, something to that effect. So that would be your ASA 1 or 2 who ended up um, with that kind of severe um, outcome. And what they show is that uh, with opioid-related sentinel events, um, the majority were due to wrong dosing, unfortunately, um, and those events are usually death or ischemic brain, hypoxic ischemic brain injury. But 29 percent, they said, could be preventable with better monitoring. The Anesthesia Closed Claims Database, which collects lawsuits due to uh, opioid-related respiratory events, when they analyzed that data, they basically said 97 percent of those events would be preventable with better monitoring. So, um, you know, as you know, the, the anesthesia, you know, any kind of lawsuits um, are just the, the tip of the iceberg, right? So, um, anyway, I, I encourage you to look at some of these numbers. They're kind of impressive. So, what, what monitoring choices do we have for um, for trying to detect respiratory depression, you know, however you decide to define that. Um, the, the first is obviously some of our clinical monitoring choices, so having nurses check in on our patients. Obviously, that is only going to get you intermittent checking, typically um, either respiratory rate or sedation monitoring are, uh, are ordered or requested. You know, but there's, but as we know, as um, anesthesia providers, um, we know that the respiratory rate alone, it doesn't tell you the whole story. Um, really, our nurses need to know how to evaluate depth of respiration, apneic events, obstruction. Um, so respiratory rate doesn't give you the full picture. We can also rely on monitors. There's, um, there are, you know, arterial blood gases, obviously we're not going to do that for all our surgical patients. It's quite invasive and unnecessary in most patients. Um, we have impedance plasmography. This, um, as you, anyone who's seen this, you know, we still use it in the PACU. It's, you know, you have to have um, EKG monitoring, but there's, it usually suffers from a lot of artifact. We have our pulse oximeters, which give us some, um, some data. And uh, we'll talk a little bit more about why it's not the continuous pulse oximetry is not the ideal monitor for looking for respiratory uh, depression. And then we have end tidal CO2 and transcutaneous CO2 monitoring, which give you um, which give you an idea of of people's uh, rest, uh, ventilatory status, I should say. So, um, so let's talk a little bit about what people typically order, um, me, meaning the uh, clinical, the intermittent clinical nursing checks. <clears throat> so there was actually a really interesting study that looked at, um, it was in our nursing journals, that basically looked at eight hospitals um, and um, 
and they were looking at compliance of uh, respiratory monitoring. Or, and, um, and in particular, I want to draw your attention to, to the most commonly ordered uh, monitoring modalities, which are respiratory rate and sedation um, monitoring. And you can see in um, you can see that uh, this is divided into every two and a half hours versus every four and a half hours. And you can see that compliance in respiratory rate um, and sedation score uh, for, for if you're requesting it every two and a half hours is pretty abysmal. About 36% um, actually record a, a respiratory rate or sedation score. Um, if you ask for monitoring every four and a half, the compliance goes up. Um, but uh, what's, what's kind of um, ironic about this is usually you're asking for more monitoring more frequently in the patients you're most concerned about. So the fact that our compliance is poorest in those that we're asking for every two and a half to every four and a half, uh, for every two and a half hours is worse than if we're asking for it in every four and a half hours. Um, it's it's kind of concerning. But, you know, if we're asking to monitor every single person, then um, every two and a half hours, it's a big burden for the nurse to go in there um, every two and a half hours. Not surprising, they're busy with other patients, right? You can see that, you know, again, you know, depending on your nursing staff ratio, if you look at our um, hospital E and F, where they were actually looking at ICUs, compliance is much higher. Not a surprise, right? But nurses are one of our most valuable resources, right, and our most expensive resource in the hospital. And so, um, in essence, you know, yes, you can improve monitoring with more nursing, uh, with higher uh, ratios, you know, one-to-one -one ratios in an ICU, but um, probably on the, the surgical floors, it's not, um, it's not ideal. The interesting thing is if you look at um, our, our closed claims data, so these were the, the, um, these were the lawsuits with poor outcomes on patients who had opioid-related respiratory events, you can see that, um, that there was a nursing check in uh, about, you know, 14% of the cases within, you know, 15 minutes. Um, in about 20% of the cases, there had been a nurse in the room within, within the hour, and like 12% of the cases, a nurse was in there within two hours. 60% um, of the patients were noted to be somnolent prior to a respiratory event. But what I'm trying to show here is that, you know, even when your nurse was in that room, with um, that, uh, that patients can still have a, a bad outcome, a really bad outcome, a sentinel event. This was also an interesting study, again, post-surgical patients. It was an observational study. They had 800 patients. They basically um, they basically hid a continuous pulse oximeter, um, you know, not showing them what the what the numbers were, and then they had their routine every four to six hour nursing spot checks for desaturation, and they showed that 21% um, of patients had a desaturation that was greater than 10 minutes and 37% of the patients had a desaturation that was um, over an hour. So, uh, so basically what they're, they were showing here is that we're really missing a lot of these desaturation events. So you think to yourself, okay, well, that's easy. You know, what I'll do is I'll slap on a pulse oximeter and everything will be uh, okay. You know, we'll be able to detect all of these, um, uh, all of these, events and, uh, and save lives? Well, not so fast. So um, as we know, this is, um, this is actually a really interesting curve that, um, that shows us, uh, um, that shows us one of our kind of basic physiologic, um, basic physiologic equations, okay, our, um, that we learn in, in school, okay? It's basically our uh, partial pressure of, 
of alveolar oxygen um, uh, equation, okay? But, uh, you know, it looks like a bunch of, like most equations, it looks like something you'll never understand, but, or I'll never understand. But uh, what I want to show you here it, um, in, this, uh, in this graph is that, okay, this, this, first, this first curve here is room air, right, 0.21. Um, and you can see that in order to maintain a partial pressure, um, a PaO2 of 100 or, you know, 90% saturation, your alveolar ventilation needs to be mm, at a, a little under four. So, you know, a pretty good alveolar ventilation, a good, um, a good ventilatory uh, number, right? You could argue four liters per minute is pretty darn good, right? But then even if you just increase your, the oxygen delivery to 0.3, okay, in order to maintain that partial pressure of oxygen of 100 or 90%, now your alveolar ventilation only needs to be 1.5 liters per minute, and we can all agree that that's some severe respiratory depression. So even if you just increase your FiO2 to 0.3 and administer a little bit of supplemental oxygen, someone can be really severely hypoventilating. So you are tricked um, by that number, that 90% uh, saturation on their pulse oximeter when they're in fact hypoventilating severely. I hope that makes sense. <laughs> so, um, so in essence, um, you know, here's, here's, so in essence, someone can be severely hypoventilating on oxygen and your oxygen saturation is going to look fantastic. Okay. So um, we need to look at other parameters. This here is a study that shows that, um, that pulse oximeter, it's, it's actually um, a systematic review and meta-analysis. Um, I encourage you to, to look at this because I, I found it um, very interesting. Um, they were looking to see if continuous pulse oximetry, in fact, you know, reduced uh, mortality. Um, and they weren't able to show um, whether it actually reduces rapid response team calls or mortality. Um, there was a trend toward reducing ICU transfers. Um, there are some studies out there that show that it, in fact, does reduce ICU transfers, others that don't. Um, but they did conclude that there was more interventions done um, to try and uh, prevent respiratory failure. So continuous pulse oximetry, they basically concluded, was 15 times more likely to detect respiratory depression than nursing checks alone. Okay, now, you know, unfortunately, there are a lot of false alarms, um, but, you know, sometimes people argue, well, depending on the setting, it may be um, beneficial to have, uh, you know, to be more conservative. They did, uh, they also determined that capnography, though, was six times more likely to detect respiratory depression than pulse oximetry and to detect it earlier. Um, now, I think that, uh, I think that it's, and, you know, one of their conclusions and a conclusion that I think is very, um, is clear that we need to uh, make here is that, you know, oxygenation does not equal ventilation. Um, that we need to make sure, particularly in our patients where we're delivering oxygen, that we, that we know that we're masking uh, respiratory depression by doing that. And my slides are, okay. <clears throat> so what do our, you know, uh, ASA guidelines say? Okay, these, um, actually the ASA and ASRA put together these guidelines. They work together um, with this last version. But in essence, they said, um, they said that, you know, they do believe respiratory depression is preventable if we're monitoring ventilation and that we should be doing that in the first 24 hours postoperatively. And they also agree that pulse oximetry is not a substitute for monitoring um, ventilation. But um, they don't go, um, 
but, you know, they put out these practice guidelines for prevention, detection, and management of respiratory depression only in the setting of neuraxial opioid administration. You know, so I thought, you know, well, why is it that they're that they're only putting out um, these practice guidelines for neuraxial opioid administration. And as you can imagine, this is a political organization. And so, you know, they, they're they not going to touch PCAs, and I'll show you that data in just a minute. The PCAs don't have any less um, risk than neuraxial opioid administration. Um, so why is it that the ASA has practice guidelines for neuraxial opiates and not um, and not PCAs. Well, it's because when you start getting into the realm of PCA opioid administration, now you're talking about almost every uh, specialty of medicine out there. And so obviously they're not gonna put guidelines out for that, but I want you to know and see that when we look at our um, closed claims database, you can see that you know PCA and neuraxial opioid um, you know, had the same number of claims. There was no difference. Um, you know, this is this is just all other administrations. You know, a, a single shot IV or um, or intramuscular or, or whatever. Um, I crossed out multimodal here because um, you know, with all of our talk of multimodal analgesia, that's not what this means. This actually means opiates administered via multiple routes. So meaning neuraxil in combination with um, with some other route like intravenous or intramuscular. Um, so uh, in essence, there's, uh, but you can see that that actually carries the highest risk, okay? Most of the patients um, who were in the, this, um, were in this closed claims analysis who had a, uh, a respiratory event, in fact, had opioids administered via multiple routes, okay? So that's probably the highest risk. Um, the ASA uh, in this in their document um, on prevention, detection, and management of respiratory depression associated with neuraxial opiates, though we know that PCA and uh, opiates are no uh, less dangerous, they say that you should be uh, monitoring for adequacy of ventilation. They always say ventilation in this, and they say via respiratory route, depth of, of respiration, um, oxygenation, pulse oximeter when appropriate, and level of consciousness. And in some patients, in p patients who are at increased risk for respiratory depression, that we should be increasing that monitoring, mean, meaning either the intensity, duration, or additional methods of monitoring. So who are those patients at risk um, of respiratory depression? I'll get into that in just a minute. Having a little bit of a delay here in my advancement of my slides. All right, so the uh, Anesthesia Patient Safety Foundation. Now, you know, we talked about what the the ASA recommends, and they don't they don't come out and say it has to be continuous. Um, they say. Um, that you can use continual intermittent, which is every hour for you know 12 to 24 hours. But you know that that society is about well, how do we keep patients safe, but also consider resource resources and what hospitals can might be able to do or might not be able to do. Um, whereas um, a society like the Anesthesia Patient Safety Foundation, their mission is, um, and their goal is that no patient will be harmed. So, you know, the, I mean, that, that's a, a fantastic goal, but at the same time, you have to wonder how realistic that is in an age where, um, where you know, resources allocation and, um, and uh, cost uh, need to be considered. But that aside, um, their mission is that nobody should be harmed. And they basically say um, that, uh, that, you know, here we are, we have this, you know, requirement that while someone is being sedated, that we need to do carbon dioxide monitoring, right? And, and they argue that, well, why don't we have a similar degree of monitoring in the post-operative setting when our patients are being sedated um, with um, with our uh, intravenous, you know, opioid PCAs, uh, and they agree that uh, capnography or other monitoring modalities 
uh, they talk about capnography because right now that's the most um, the most easily or readily available, I would say, even though I would argue it's still not readily available in, in some hospital settings, that that it's really carbon dioxide monitoring that's required for assessing adequacy of ventilation. Uh, and they argue that the monitoring should be continuous oxygenation and ventil ventilatory monitoring, both. The Joint Commission also agrees that uh, quality and adequacy of respiration needs to be monitored, and they specifically say that staff should be educated not to rely on pulse oximetry alone, and we just learned all that. Um, another Patient Safety Movement Foundation um, also agrees that patients should have continuous monitoring, um, particularly uh, in the setting of opiates. And going uh, back to the Joint Commission, they say that when you're, use, when you're choosing to use pulse oximetry and capnography, it should be used continuously rather than intermittently. And, you know, that's um, based on the literature out there that show that these events happen within minutes of a nurse having walked out of that patient's room. So now you know that, um, that Many organizations recommend continuous um, uh, pulse oximetry and or uh, capnography, um, excuse me, carbon dioxide monitoring, some kind of continuous monitoring to ensure someone is breathing adequately. What are some of the risk factors? When are we concerned that our patient uh, should be monitored more closely? Well, we know that obstructive sleep apnea, morbid obesity, patients who snore, uh, and many uh, hospitals out there do have a, some kind of screening in the perioperative period, uh, particularly in our pre-anesthetic uh, assessments. Um, now we have our electronic medical records. People are trying to, you know, link, um, link in these uh, risks um, these, you know, risk, um, I'll show that to you in just a second, are validated questionnaires to assess for uh, obstructive sleep apnea. You know, but we're also taking into consideration patients' age, whether um, they're opioid naive or not, whether, uh, you know, there are certain surgeries that are at higher risk, those, you know, uh, clearly, you know, thoracotomies and upper abdominal surgeries where Patients can splint in addition to be having respiratory depression from their opiates, and they require high doses of opiate medication, obviously general anesthetics, patients with cardiopulmonary um, comorbidities, and uh, in particular, concomitant um, sedating drugs uh, are very, um, you know, patients also don't sleep, so they request a Valium, and then you're really um, in trouble. We really need to modify and or start with high intensity um, respiratory monitoring. These are some of the validated uh, questionnaires for sleep apnea. Uh, we have the stop bang and we have, you know, Berlin questionnaire. Uh, many people try and incorporate these questionnaires into, into their electronic medical record to try and get that risk stratification prior to the surgery and then they can evaluate with those anticipated perioperative risk factors, things like the extent of the surgery, how painful, how many opiates they're going to, how much opiate they're going to consume afterwards, and with this OSA questionnaire, then they can figure out, well, what is the intensity of monitoring that I need for this patient? Uh, going back to this chart where I showed you that, um, that it is a combination of, of opiates that tend to cause a problem. You can also see that uh, in the majority of these cases, there were also interactions with opiates and non-opiates, the dating medications, so that concomitant um, drug administration. And obviously, that's more likely to happen if you have more physicians prescribing that patient's post-operative um, analgesia regimen. Um, so, kind of limiting who, who is uh, administering all these opiates and making sure that our orders 
specifically state, especially if we give neuraxial opiates, you know, there are other physicians who may not know what that means or what the implications are when they order a benzo on top of that, or they they have some additional pain, you know, order a PCA on top of that. So um, we do need to be working in multidisciplinary teams, making sure we're very clear that people understand what we're doing uh, for our patients' pain control in the postoperative setting so that uh, no one does anything dangerous or something that you might disagree with in that postoperative setting. So this is kind of a busy slide here. Let me just kind of try and simplify it and take you through it. This is um, a system the systematic review and meta-analysis again that um, that's kind of summarizes when or the advantages and disadvantages of continuous pulse oximetry monitoring as well as continuous, um, in this case, capnography monitoring. Obviously, the advantages to continuous pulse oximetry, you know, it's not invasive, it's easy to interpret, we, you know, have, uh, it has been shown to maybe reduce ICU transfers. Um, and, uh, you know, if it does that, obviously, there's cost savings associated with it. Advantages of capnography is that, you know, it's an early detector of hypoventilation, particularly in the setting of supplemental oxygen. Again, this is also uh, non-invasive. It has been shown to prevent harm from respiratory depression. Um, it allows for titration of medications because you can uh, um, you can titrate medications based on someone's ventilatory status. But, you know, with these come disadvantages as well. You know, with, like we talked about with continuous pulse oximetry, you're masking hypoventilation in the setting of supplemental oxygen, and your pulse oximeter is basically going to be um, kind of useless in that setting. You, you know, it hinders the patient's ability to kind of use their hands, right? They're moving around. You get a lot of artifacts, particularly if it's uh, on their fingers. And that artifact leads to false alarms and alarm fatigue in our providers. The disadvantage to capnography is it's actually, it requires a lot of education to, um, to evaluate the tracing. It's difficult to capture that tracing, you know, depending on how people breathe, whether they're mouth breathers or not. Um, people can't move around. It's on their face. People don't like it on their face. Um, and, uh, and thus, you know, leads to a lot of false alarms. The nice thing about the transcutaneous CO2 monitor is it's actually a, a quantitative monitor as opposed to a qualitative monitor. You don't need a lot of education on that CO2 tracing so that, um, so it's much easier to use. And to me, it's, it seems much more practical for, for example, in the PACU setting or in the post-operative setting on the floor, um, you know, and I'll show this to you in just a minute, uh, what it actually looks like and, and how it's used, but it's much, much simpler than, you know, having something on someone's face, you know, trying to interpret um, whether they're just, you know, not, they're breathing through their mouth or are they actually hypoventilating and all of these other things that uh, make technography kind of difficult to use. And, uh, you know, obviously if someone has a CPAP machine, again, you know, uh, difficult to know whether capnography really is um, helpful in this setting. This is just an example of all the websites that are available to um, teach people how to use a, uh, and interpret the capnography uh, waveform. You know, it's actually, um, uh, it does require plenty of, of education. And, and clearly for, you know, an intraoperative patient, an anesthesiologist, a nurse anesthetist, you know, we should take the time to educate ourselves on, on these, uh, on these waveforms and on capnography, but um, so that, because it tells us so much more than just a number, but um, certainly in the postoperative period, it, uh, it would not, be um, as helpful. It may be helpful in a in a case where, and, and I'll show you, there are some cases, I think, that we can use it intraoperatively that actually would be more useful than, um, than end tidal CO2, and I'll bring some of those to your attention, and you'll go, ah, yes, of course. <laughs> so, um, as you know, um, 
with ventilation perfusion mismatch, um, our arterial uh, CO2 can rise um, uh, without a rise in end tidal CO2, so there are plenty of, of situations where our capnography may not be um, may not be helpful. Just yesterday, I had a patient who uh, whose end tidal CO2 was 39. We sent our ABG, and in fact, her um, her arterial CO2 was 49. So there was a huge difference, and it was because she had um, some bronchospasm going on, but um, or some obstruction. And so it's not always um, it's not always helpful uh, in that uh, in every sense. So you know that um, our, you know we have our physiologic dead space equation. This is. Um, this is where there is a certain percentage of tidal volume that's not contributing to gas exchange, where, you're, where alveoli, alveoli are being ventilated but, um, but underperfused. And um, you know, these scenarios um, include things like um, uh, you know, emphysema, things with you know, pulmonary uh, embolism, uh, shunting of of blood, you know, um, excuse me. Um, so anything that kind of like um, anything where where you know you may be ventilating someone, but that that um, those alveoli are not contributing to um, gas exchange. Shunt tends to be something that's that's that we see more commonly. Um, uh, but you know it has to be pretty profound in order to contribute to hypercapnia. This is where we have perfused alveoli, but they're underventilated. This would be you know in the setting of of atelectasis or pneumonia or pulmonary edema or mucus plugging or um, something to that effect, like um, I had in my case. So, um, and this has been shown in studies that there are times when end tidal CO2 monitoring is just not accurate. Um, increased dead space ventilation and a lot of our critically ill patients, they have pulmonary um, problems that contribute to um, a inaccurate end tidal CO2. Um, sometimes in our interoperative care, like I was just discussing, one, one lung ventilation patients um, and depending on patient positioning, uh, so anyway, this is a, a there are a whole litany of places where we know that our and because we've been trained on it, the end tidal um, CO2 monitoring is not as accurate. I think the transcutaneous CO2 monitor um, is uh, can solve a lot of those problems because it's not dependent on someone actually um, someone's ventilation. Uh, or at least detecting someone's ventilation. It's a continuous monitor. It provides both pulse oximetry and, um, and carbon dioxide monitoring. Uh, I'll show you, so it's transcutaneous, and I'll show you how that works. Um, and of course, there's central monitoring um, capability, so you, know, you can hook it up to your patient and watch, watch from the nursing station if needed. Um, so what is it? It's actually a stove severing house type electrode. It's, it's a heated sensor, so it brings the blood to the surface of the skin so that, um, and it actually measures a change in pH and converts that to a CO2 reading. And there have been, um, people have uh, studied this, and you can see it's, uh, it's, it's quite accurate. It's usually within 7.5 millimeters of of mercury, um, that would be like two standard deviations out. So, um, but for the most part, um, it's um, quite accurate compared to an ABG, um, which is a, considered our gold standard. This, uh, so these are the different locations that you can put the CO2 uh, monitor. Depending on the location, you can either pick up. Only, uh, only carbon dioxide monitoring or both pulse oximetry and carbon dioxide monitoring. So all the green spots, so um, it actually uh, works best if there's some bone underlying um, the, the site that you place it. Um, it looks like, so it's called the multi-site attachment ring. Um, it literally looks like a little EKG pad except it sticks much better. 
And um, the nice thing is, is that this, the, uh, the monitor probe actually can rotate around. Um, so if someone moves around, it doesn't, you know, pull like a, like a EKG, you know, cable does. So people are much more mobile. And you can see, you can keep it out of, you know, there are multiple locations on the torso, you know, that you can place it depending on what you want to monitor. You, you can also put it on the face. I work with, um, with women who just delivered. They don't, you know, they want to take pictures with their babies, so they don't like it on their face. But, you know, the, I found that the, the deltoid was a perfect spot to place, um, to place this monitor. Uh, let's see. So these are all the advantages. I just kind of listed them. I've already said these. It's easy. It's quantitative, not dependent on tidal volume. The pulse oximeter is built in, um, you know, unlike capnography, it's a, you know, separate monitor from the pulse oximeter. And, um, and I think that it makes patients less aggravated because it's not on their face. Um, so what are some... Uh, Sometimes when transcutaneous CO2 monitoring, you know, has been used and is found to be highly accurate. So in the critically ill patients and ventilated patients, it's um, been shown to be highly accurate because it's not dependent on whether they have a pneumonia or not uh, in one lung ventilation um, because you're actually looking more at what the uh, carbon dioxide is in the blood as opposed to through the lungs. Um, uh, let's see, in our morbidly obese patients, laparoscopic patients, people have used it um, in patients who are sedated to look for trends in their um, CO2. So, like I said, it's, um, this monitor could be used um, in our sedation cases to watch for trends. Uh, and then, of course, there are specific times, and all of you have been in these cases that where, you know, you can't hook up your end tidal CO2 monitor, you know, with high-frequency jet ventilation or high-frequency oscillation, uh, oscillation in the ICU, um, one, lung, one lung ventilation, you know, your capnography is completely inaccurate. Um, maybe prolonged apneic phases when they're doing vocal cord surgery. Um, so there are multiple um, uses intra-op, I think, in special cases intra-op where it could be useful. But um, I particularly think that it's useful in our high in our high risk patients, you know, in the PACU, in the post-op, um, on our post-op wards where, you know, patients where our nursing staff isn't necessarily trained in, you know, all of the subtleties of capnography, where they can get a, a number, they can watch a trend, um, and uh, using this monitor um, to help look for respiratory depression. And that is, so in conclusion, you know, the safety and economic burden of respiratory failure is pretty high in the perioperative setting. Uh, we, there are plenty of societies that do believe that the continuous um, pulse oximetry and respiratory monitoring can um, help identify and mitigate some of these uh, respiratory arrests and events. We should be screening our patients who are high risk for respiratory depression and, um, and those who are at high risk um, although the ASA doesn't say that we need continuous monitoring, certainly we need to increase our intensity. Um, uh, there are plenty of societies that do think we need continuous monitoring. You do need to increase um, the intensity and, um, and probably duration of monitoring. You know, do I think that every single patient should be monitored? I think that if we're watching every single patient very carefully, that, um, that we're watching no one carefully. I think we really need to focus our attention on our high-risk patients and make sure that, um, you know, we are, um, that when we are asking for intensity of monitoring, that, um, that those patients are really being watched carefully. Uh, I think that uh, our transcutaneous, um, this transcutaneous carbon dioxide monitoring allows us to do con both continuous pulse oximetry and ventilatory monitoring um, that's 
much more convenient for the patient and the healthcare provider and um, more accurate, certainly, um, in many settings than uh, capnography. And I'm going to leave it here, see if there are any questions, and do my best to answer those. Thank you for attending. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Boshaw, for a really, really wonderful presentation. And uh, yes, we do have some questions, so let's go right to them. Uh, and this is, uh, this is cons uh, considering the, the volume of alarms that uh, everyone has to deal with. What are your thoughts regarding the emerging smart alarm technologies that look at multiple uh, physiologic monitored parameters and consolidate those into one patient safety alarm threshold? Good question. Ooh. Okay, so <laughs> you kind of broke up at the very beginning of that um, question. Can you just sure. start in on the question again just to make sure I have the whole thing? Sure. What are your thoughts? regarding the emerging smart alarm technologies mm -hmm. that look at multiple physiologic monitored parameters mm -hmm. and consolidate mm -hmm. those into one patient mm -hmm. safety alarm threshold? Very interesting question. Yeah, so, um, so I've seen a couple of those. Um, my, <laughs> and maybe it's my, my lack of wanting to give up that much control to sort of an algorithm that, um, that I'm, you know, I, I think that that probably, it's one of the things that I like about this monitor is that it sort of takes a, a few of our, um, a few monitors and kind of puts it in one where you can see the pulse oximeter and you can see the, the, um, the carbon dioxide reading. The smart monitors, um, you know, I know that there are different algorithms for when they actually alarm and, and, and all that. I, you know, I mean, a lot of you use the BIS monitor, and uh, so you might be kind of familiar with just having a number um, with, you know, all this, um, with some kind of algorithm that you don't know exactly how they came up with that number. Uh, and um, I find that, that you know, the best you could, you end up using your judgment anyway and looking at the individual, you know, well, is this person, does, you know, with the BIS monitor, you're like, well, is this person paralyzed? Am I using ketamine? Is it, you know, so, um, so I don't know. I, uh, maybe I need to be convinced a little bit more about the smart monitors. Um, I, uh, you know, uh, maybe it's just, maybe it's my bias against just having an algorithm and having someone say this is a great algorithm because it, you know, looks at these parameters and then it will alarm that, uh, I don't know, maybe I'm not that trusting. <laughs> but uh, but maybe maybe I can be convinced otherwise. <laughs> Let me sum up the, uh, the, the whole thing in, uh, in a nutshell right there. Um, <laughs> So next question, how close to real time is mm -hmm. the transcutaneous monitor reading? Oh, it's it's instantaneous. So so I've used this um, and I've used another monitor very similar to this. The the other monitor was very touchy and, and hard to use. This one was actually very easy in my my so I, I used it under the, the context of um, doing a research project and so my clinical nurses were like so thankful that I switched to this one because it was so easy to just put on. It um, it calibrates very quickly and um, and within seconds, uh, you can see changes in um, in carbon dioxide. Um, so, um, you know, I think that the, the questions that kind of remain is, you know, what should what is the threshold for, you know, when I should be really concerned about respiratory depression, or whether or whether there even should be a threshold? Should it be a change in um, carbon dioxide readings? Uh, before I'm, you know, concerned about a patient. Um, so I don't think we've made that link between, well, you know, and we haven't done this with capnography either, is kind of saying, well, when is it that I've, you know, that I'm in trouble? Is there, is there a, t you know, or I should say, we always know we're in trouble when, <laughs> when your patient is clinically not doing well, right? But where are those thresholds 
with carbon dioxide monitoring that um, predict a clinical event. And I think that's where the question still kind of lies uh, with our carbon dioxide monitoring uh, technologies, ventilatory monitoring technologies. Excellent, thanks. When should I select digital TCPCO2 instead of ETCO2 in mm. the clinical setting? Hmm. So, um, so I would say that, you know, so in my last, um, in one of my last slides, uh, I think the, I kind of summarized what, um, where I thought that this monitor would be most useful, um, certainly in the setting of, you know, some of these special intraoperative cases where we know our end tidal CO2 is inaccurate or not giving us an, an accurate picture. Um, versus, uh, and certainly in the post-operative period where you have, you know, where you have nurses that, you know, they're not going to sit down and do, you know, a 15-minute or 20-minute or half-hour and, you know, re-education on end tidal CO2 and how you read it and how, you know, effective that, um, uh, you know, and, and how to interpret capnography. So um, that's where I think that this monitor is of most value, are those special interoperative uh, cases as well as in the postoperative period when you want a number for um, that, uh, to make it clear when someone should be calling or escalating that patient's care. Okay, thank you. Given that this is a perfusion-based monitor, can you speak to the issues of site selection and signal acquisition. Mm, okay, so um, I, uh, I mean, I know it has been shown to be effective in the ICU. I haven't used it in the ICU setting, but um, there have been multiple studies, maybe, um, uh, and uh, but I have used it at multiple sites in you know particular patients in mainly uh, pregnant women, um, and uh, I haven't had any trouble with site selection in, in that sense. Um, you know, I would, but, you know, I would presume most of our septic patients, you know, you, you can have problems with, you know, picking up pulse oximetry because their extremities are so, um, you know, poorly perfused when they're on vasopressors, but their trunk is for the most part, always going to be well perfused, and that's you know what, where most of you know your um, your transcutaneous CO2 monitoring sites are, um, and so that's why I think it's been shown to be accurate in our critically ill patients. Okay, thanks. Well, here's a, another good question from apparently somebody who has been at this for a while. Where do you okay. see the where do you see the most significant changes between what TCM was before and what it is now. TCM, sorry, transcutaneous uh -huh. monitoring. There monitoring. Go. <laughs> <laughs> um, so uh, I would, so for transcutaneous CO2 monitoring, I would like to see, um, like to see us do uh, more research to figure out, to, to link it to clinical events. Um, and I would like to see it, he, um, used more in the post-operative um, setting where, uh, and figure out what those thresholds are for, um, you know, including in our, uh, in our mu scores and our, you know, in our vital signs, um, you know, early warning vital signs uh, measures uh, to see you know, I just think that um, we have too many patients on on oxygen that's sort of obscuring when patients are really having problems. Um, so I would like to see this monitor be sort of figured out some of what those thresholds should be for escalating care and, and deciding when someone is really having uh, respiratory depression before it becomes a respiratory, a clinical respiratory event. Excellent. Well, thank you very, very much, Dr. Boshaw, oh, for a you. wonderful presentation. Yeah, and, and great answers to those questions, and thank all of you for those questions. And uh, we're just about running out of time here, so let me quickly
recap some of our housekeeping here. If uh, any of you who attended today would like to receive AERC, if you're a respiratory therapist, AERC credit, or AACN, SERP credit for nurses, or AENA contact hour for nurse anesthetists, or certificate of attendance, lots of different things available here today. Here's how that will work when you leave the session. Uh, and close the WebEx window, you will land, see the evaluation open in your browser. You won't land on it, but you'll see it in your browser. So leave your browser open and um, fill it out, send it right in so that you can receive your certificate of attendance within a couple of days. If you wait to send in your evaluation, it can take up to two weeks to receive your certificate. So do send it in right away. If you are the person who has logged in for a group at your facility, uh, listen carefully, please. You'll be receiving, whoever logged in will be receiving an email from messenger at webex.com in about a minute. So keep an eye out for that email and forward it to everyone who joined in your group. And also, if you have joined us on a mobile device, keep an eye out for that email because the evaluation will not automatically open when you close the app on your on your smartphone or tablet. So keep an eye out for that email from messenger at webex.com. It will be sent to the person, who, or the, to the email address that you used to log in. And uh, if you'd like to access today's slides or recording, we'll, they'll be posted within 24 hours or so. So uh, Susanna has just put that into the chat box so you can copy and paste it. Thank you, Suze. Uh, copy and paste it and have that available anytime you'd like to access the follow-up materials from today's session. Any unanswered questions or questions that come up in the next few days, weeks, months, hours, whatever, send them here and uh, they'll be sure and get uh, some answers for you. Uh, so I'd like to thank everyone for joining us. A big thanks to you, Dr. Boshaw, for a wonderful presentation. Thank you. And we'll be hearing you again, thankfully, in literally exactly three hours from now. So anyone, yeah, so I, to everyone who would like to uh, attend uh, the second session or have some colleagues to attend the sec second session, it will begin at, uh, at 1 o'clock Eastern today, so you can figure out where you are in time zones, what time that is. So thank you again, Dr. Bouchard, for a wonderful presentation. And a big thanks to our friends at Syntec for sponsoring today's event, and thank all of you for joining us. We hope that you'll join us again very soon for another Centex sponsored educational event. Have a wonderful rest of your day and thank you Dr. Rashad and we will see you in a few hours. Thanks everyone. Thanks, thanks a lot. Thanks for attending everyone. Okay. Bye bye all.